include the development of hospital guidelines and clinical pathways with interprofessional teams across the health system. After completing this class, you all should be able to explain the importance and steps of evidence-based practice, identify the role of the librarian in teaching, practicing, and supporting evidence-based practice, and formulate a clinical question based on the scope of the requester's problem, PICO, and question type. All right, so clinical trials are not a result of modern med medicine. So evidence-based decision-making isn't new. In fact, humans have been interested in figuring out how to improve health and prevent disease for centuries. Actually, the first account of a clinical trial in humans dates back to the Old Testament book of Daniel and describes an experiment comparing the different dietary patterns of Babylonian versus Israel Israelite children. Another good example from the mid 18th century was when Dr. James Lind investigated the cause of and cure for scurvy in British sailors. Next slide. Fast forward to modern times, where in 2001, the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, released Crossing the Quality Chasm, a new health system for the 21st century. This paper, made an urgent call for the need for fundamental changes to the American healthcare system to close the gap between current clinical practices and optimal patient care. Next slide. This was because, oh, sorry. This was because their research found that modern medicine was leaning too heavily on decision-making based on formal training, no matter how long ago, and clinical intuition. This process leads to variations in care that aren't supported by research evidence and included little involvement from the patient. With the emergence of patient-centered care and access to medical resources on the internet, it became more and more important than ever that providers were integrating research and evidence-based guidelines into the care of their patients. Evidence-based practice helped to bridge that gap between research and day-to-day -day practice. The goal of evidence-based practice is to minimize the amount of time it takes to put evidence into practice. However, research shows we still have a long way to go. In 2011, Morris and colleagues released, review, uh, released a review that quantified time lags in the development of health interventions. At that time, it took an average of 17 years for research to go from, um, for research to go through the translation from basic research to everyday practice. Unfortunately, this, a study published recently, so in 2021 by Khan and colleagues, data is complete. looked specifically at five cancer control evidence-based practices so they looked at mammography, clinicians' advice to quit smoking, colorectal cancer screening, HPV co-testing, and HPV vaccination. And they found that the time from publication to implementation still ranges from 13 to 21 years with an average of 15 years. And really this shows us that we still have the ability to make big impacts um, through the use of evidence-based practice. Next slide. So with this in mind, what is evidence-based practice? Next slide. So EBP or evidence-based practice is a framework for solving problems that improves point of care and medical decision-making, maximizes research efforts, minimizes variability and promotes innovation. Um, this methodology really came to light in the early 1990s uh, when Dr. David Sackett uh, coined the process as evidence-based medicine, uh, but it really has expanded to include a more robust framework that integrates best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values and preferences. The goal of EBP is to formalize the steps and expedite the process of putting new research findings into practice at the bedside. 
As I mentioned already, until the introduction of evidence-based medicine, clinical decision-making was typically based on training and provider intuition. This is also called empiric therapy or clinician gestalt. It's based on the ability of a clinician to recognize patterns of disease based on historical facts and physician exam findings and generate potential solutions. Research suggests that years of experience does positively influence a clinician's pattern recognition skills. Um, and evidence-based practice as we know it today came out of the de desire in the 1970s and 1980s to strengthen these skills more quickly. Current EBP methodology continues to acknowledge the importance of the skills and abilities needed for empiric therapy as it is integrated as clinical expertise. Next slide. In the early 1990s, evidence-based medicine was introduced with a focus on clinical appraisal of primary research and the development of systematic reviews and clinical practice guidelines. It became important for clinicians to understand the results of clinical trials and determine to how best apply them in their everyday practice. It was during this period in the evolution of evidence-based practice that the hierarchy of evidence was developed. This hierarchy was based on the idea that controlled clinical observations in humans provided more trustworthy evidence than uncontrolled observations animal experiments or empiric therapies. Researchers began to focus on the importance of randomized controlled trials or RCTs as the highest level of evidence for decision-making. Next slide. The initial hierarchy of evidence is shown here, focuses on study type and consider only randomized controlled trials to be high level evidence. Since then, the evidence hierarchy has morphed and expanded as the options and opportunities in the evidence-based practice space have changed over time. As you can see, in many versions of the hierarchy of evidence, systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and even clinical practice guidelines live higher in the pyramid than randomized controlled trials do. And now in the COVID era, we're being forced to ask ourselves, <clears throat> excuse me, we're being forced to ask ourselves, where does preprint literature fit within this hierarchy? There are many ways that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted EDP, which we'll talk about it in more detail momentarily. Next slide. So let's take a moment to look at how this EBP explosion has impacted librarianship. Through the late 1990s and 2000s, the EBP movement solidified itself in medicine and expanded to other healthcare specialties. As specialties tailored their, the evidence-based practice model to their needs, the opportunity for in integrating research evidence into day-to-day -day patient care exploded. The evidence-based movement also expanded the application of research to fields outside of healthcare. For example, with evidence-informed practice in public health and social work, and even evidence-based library and information practice, everyone was trying to figure out ways to prevent reinventing the wheel, so to speak. But no one can talk about EBP in the COVID era without acknowledging how the COVID-19 pandemic has forced EBP into the public eye. During the pandemic, the speed and severity of, of illness challenged traditional models of evidence-based translation at a never seen before pace. This forced healthcare and public health providers to recognize that sometimes the evidence to support practice is limited. And that in some cases it was up to them as providers to balance the novel treatments and potential harms. This meant that the this meant that evidence-based recommendations changed a lot and they changed often. So we all lived through this 
um, what were some of the recommendations that you all remember hearing about and seeing change during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic? Wanted to kind of open up, uh, open up quickly just to get a little bit of feedback from you all. What do you guys remember changing? Um, and what did you remember seeing play out in the media and in um, your lives at the beginning of the pandemic? Starting to see some good stuff coming in. So yes, wiping down groceries, definitely. For a while, that was a yes, we do. And then it went back to, no, we don't need to do that. So as we learned more, uh, masks, fabric versus surgical mask versus N95s, and we still see that playing out. Whereas initially it was, do masks work? And then it was, yes, a mask works. And then there was literature that showed that any mask worked fabric masks were okay. And now we're reaching a point with Omicron where they're saying fabric masks aren't working anymore. We need N95s even for, for regular uh, life. Um, what else am I seeing here? Social distancing, absolutely. So we see those things kind of coming up and then we see either further inquiry and proof that those things, that those items were making a difference or they, that they didn't. And then those things were removed from the process. Negativity and positivity among countries. Absolutely. Vaccine symptoms, 100%. Also, um, if we think more clinically, things like treatments, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, um, even the use of awake prone positioning, those are all different items that have come up and have been used as treatments some of them have, have been shown to be ineffective. Others have been shown to be useful. And we're, we're really kind of learning our way through it. And we're seeing together as a, um, as a society and as a global society um, what works. And see, Carla, uh, lack of peer-reviewed research and more focus on case studies. Absolutely. And that also is where we fit in that idea of what about the, the studies that are being released with abbreviated peer review, um, or in some cases where we've even seen um, a, a, a media outlet release, uh, release information before it's been peer reviewed. And then as it went through peer review, then it never got published or um, there, were, there have been multiple retractions after dissemination through press release. So these are all great. Great examples. You guys are, you know, just it's a, it's a good way, a good touchstone to show that we're living our way through this and an EDP now is in the public eye. Um, and the plus side is that really the changes to the traditional view of EDP have shifted in some ways as a result of COVID-19. Um, because there are so many trials in progress, there's the opportunity for every patient with COVID-19 to enter a trial. Um, also, it, the collection of, of um, anonymous electronic data to support epidemiological studies has increased. Um, so the data could be used to support things like machine learning and AI techniques that may be able to answer or direct clinical inquiries faster than the traditional bench to bedside methods. So these are all great, um, you know, great ways to think about how EBP is changing now as a result of COVID-19. And COVID-19 conversations is a collaboration between the American Public Health Association and the National Academy of Medicine. And the collaboration started shortly after quarantine uh, began back in early 2020 as a way to keep public health, healthcare, and policy leaders up to date on the latest and greatest data and evidence regarding prevention, management, and treatment of the COVID-19 virus. All of these webinars have been open to the public and representatives from the media get specialized information after each webinar to assist in targeting the content to the general public. 
it's a prime example of EBP in the public eye. And the goal is to spread a compilation of the available evidence and expert opinion as quickly as possible. For example, the most recent webinar, um, which you can see that information here, uh, revealed that the current CDC guideline for COVID-19 management has already been updated 40 times. And that was about a month ago. So it's even higher than that at this point. However, COVID-19 has also caused major unintended impacts on the completion and dissemination of research findings. Um, information you see here is a study by um, Hawilla and Berg um, that really mapped out the impacts of COVID-19 on submitted and completed research interventions worldwide. Uh, as you can see at the, in the top map, the number of interventional trials submitted in the US has decreased by up to 15% as a result of the pandemic. More importantly, the completion of clinical trials that were active in 2019 was impacted significantly worldwide. That's that bottom, um, that bottom map. This limits the translation of research into practice in the coming years by delaying the length of time these trials have to run in order to, to reach publishable, publishable results. Further evaluation showed that clinical trials with a pharmaceutical sponsor were more likely to be completed during the pandemic compared to trials with academic, hospital, or government sponsors. Um, and really in, in thinking about the potential impacts of publication bias as a result of this is, is really still unknown. So kind of getting back to our evolution of EVP, um, as a result of the pitfalls of the hierarchy of evidence and that, you know, kind of using that as the, the main touchstone um, for decision making, a new approach for rating the quality of evidence was established in, 20, in 2004, and it's become more and more um, uh, important, not just in the development of guidelines, but also now in the development of um, systematic reviews and in and reading systematic reviews. Um, and that's the grade uh, criteria, the grade system, which stands for the grades of recommendation, assessment, development, and evaluation. Um, and it provides a much more sophisticated evidence structure that addresses all the different elements related to credibility of research evidence. And what GRADE does is it looks at a body of literature and accounts for limitations in the quality of evidence for RCTs uh, based on factors like study limitations, inconsistency and in imprecision of results, indirectness and publication bias. It also recognizes the potential for observational studies to provide definitive causal evidence um, which were always considered low quality evidence in the previous hierarchy. So grade creates that opportunity to hire the quality of observational evidence when there is definitive and large effects. Grade also addresses the process of moving from recommendations through to the integration of quality evidence by integrating things like the magnitude of benefits and harms, patient values and preferences, and considerations for resource use and feasibility, as well as equity. That's where I'll see complete. And really, this is just showing you that more than 100 organizations from 19 countries have endorsed GRADE. Um, and some of the clinician favorites that are now using some of the GRADE methodologies are UpToDate and Dynamed. So, oh, sorry. So EBP um, really does, has started to show improvement in patient care. Um, the, the three key ways that EBP improves care related to, is, is care, care improves care relates to quality, cost effectiveness, and safety. One example of how EBP improves quality is through the surviving sepsis campaign. Sepsis is considered one of the most expensive reasons for hospitalization, and the average hospital stay for a patient with sepsis is approximately double of other diagnoses. Uh, the Surviving Sepsis campaign recommends 
um, two bundles to treat set, to treat sepsis um, that quickly can prevent it from worsening into septic shock. Um, and research has shown that sepsis focused bundles help to reduce ICU length of stay, risk of mechanical ventilation, and need for dialysis all that result in better patient outcomes and decreased cost of care. So next is really cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is focused on providing the best care for the least amount of money per patient encounter. Uh, one way this is addressed uh, is through bundled payment programs by insurance companies. So bundled payment programs provide a single comprehensive payment that covers all of the services involved in a patient episode of care from admission through 30 days after discharge. So these programs align incentives for hospitals, post-acute care providers, physicians, and other practitioners, and also encourage all of these stakeholders to work together to improve the quality and coordination of care. So you know, EBP is an integral part of keeping that process going and keeping costs low, especially for surgical uh, bundled payment programs like total knee replacement. And last but not least is safety. EDP is an integral component of developing fall and infection prevention care programs in the hospital. For example, central line maintenance programs to prevent infections called CLABSIs. Um, is a, is a good example of, like, um, of using EBP to improve safety. Implementing a CLABC bundle policy, which groups multiple evidence-based methods together and monitoring compliance of those um, bundles of methods together through audits, keeps patients safe by minimizing hospital infections. And CLABSI bundle programs that have a 95% or higher compliance through audits um, are associated with decreases in associated infections. Next slide. So when we think about the future of EBP um, and what we're doing now to improve care, um, what, uh, when thinking about the future, um, there are um, multiple items that, that kind of come into play. So in 2017, um, Dr. Carl Hennigan uh, and his colleagues from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University um, published uh, basically an evidence-based medicine manifesto for better healthcare that focused on using what we've learned through that evolution of EBP to create more trustworthy evidence. The ultimate goal was to create an environment that supported an evidence-based approach instead of an opinion-based approach by doing, things like, by doing things like continuing to expand the role of patients, health professionals, and poly policymakers in research, and making research evidence relevant, replicable, and accessible to end users in hospitals um, and in public health as well as supporting innovation, quality improvement, and safety through the better use of real world data, which kind of ties back to a lot of that um, anonymous data process that is now going on more consistently because of COVID-19, as well as encouraging the next generation of leaders in evidence-based medicine. And really some of the points from, uh, from their manifesto uh, point directly to the strength of medical lab librarians and uh, align really well with the MLA competencies. Things like increasing the use of um, the systematic use of evidence and producing better usable clinical guidelines, getting, you know, getting librarians involved in that process consistently um, makes the guidelines more objective and complete and reducing questionable research practices, biases, and conflicts of interest. Again, you guys play a key role in that, as well as education. So education of professionals, policymakers, and the public on evidence-based practice and evidence-based healthcare to make informed choices. 
Okay. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that evolution and that history of evidence-based practice. Now we will discuss the role of the librarian in teaching, practicing, and supporting evidence-based practice. The librarian's role has evolved over time from merely supportive to a more collaborative role and even leading the EBP charge in some cases. There are roles for librarians in EBP education, clinical work, and research and dissemination. Librarians are heavily involved in evidence-based practice instruction to students, staff, residents, and faculty, as well as the assessment of EBP skills. Academic librarians are embedded in curricular classes and also serve on curriculum committees where they can lend their expertise in education planning, assessment, and curriculum mapping. Librarians have a huge impact working with residents. This includes doing quick literature reviews during morning report, teaching EBP concepts at noon conference or academic half days, teaching appraisal skills during journal clubs, and guiding residents through their quality improvement projects. Nurses also have a great need for evidence-based education and application. Librarians at magnet hospitals help guide nurses through EBP projects in the nurse residency programs. And at all hospitals, there are opportunities for librarians to partner with clinical faculty to teach EBP courses that may result in an updated hospital policy or clinical decision support tool. Increasingly, librarians are formalizing the use of evidence in our own practice through evidence-based library and information practice. Oops. I think the most exciting um, way that librarians are involved in evidence-based practice is through clinical work because we can see immediate and meaningful impact on patient care. Librarians round with clinical teams, answering questions at the point of care, and are seen as an equal member on that interprofessional team. Librarians are also involved in doing literature reviews for the development of hospital guidelines, policy and procedure documents, clinical decision support tools, and evidence briefs. This is one of the missions of the Value Institute here at MUSC. Librarians serve on a wide variety of committees, including shared gov governance at magnet hospitals, EBP advisory committees, and other committees related to quality, patient safety, and evidence-based practice. Patient education is another area where librarians can be involved. Librarians also have a role and a responsibility in ensuring that evidence-based work is properly documented and disseminated. This includes re uh, registering protocols in Prospero, co-authoring guidelines, systematic reviews, and other publication types, and disseminating that work through publications and conferences. We also have the opportunity to educate faculty on scholarly communication, institutional repositories, and other issues. Over the years, MUSE has taught a variety of project-based, evidence-based courses to hospital clinicians for CE credit. And this is an example of one of those courses, which is now on the university um, learning management system. And now we would like to hear from you. What other roles do librarians have in teaching, practicing, and supporting evidence-based practice? So just take a moment and uh, gather your thoughts and put those in the chat if you wouldn't mind. And someone asked about Prospero. Prospero is the International Registry of Systematic Reviews. Um, and so like, I, I'll just say that because there is a little differentiation obviously between systematic reviews and guidelines, but that's one way that we can take a role in that. But are there other roles that you all have um, at your institutions or that you've heard of um, that, we, that we have opportunities for teaching and practicing and supporting EBP. And I have some good examples in the chat, serving on editorial boards of journals, IRB, marketing. Yeah. So we have some good thoughts there. Okay, perfect. Thank you all. Okay, so I think this is just kind of a fun little slide um, that compares us to realtors because um, librarians really are a value added resource and we have to promote ourselves as such. 
Um, and so like when you're purchasing a home, you would seek help from a realtor. And similar, similarly, when involved in evidence-based practice, librarian expertise should be sought. The realtor has expertise with contracts and neighborhoods and trends. And we have expertise in searching, um, maybe guideline development, collaboration, all sorts of expertise that I didn't list here. Um, and then realtors have access to specialized databases like the MLS database. And just like us, we also have access to, and more importantly, proficiency in searching database and other resources. Um, the realtor serves as a liaison between buyers, sellers, insurance agents, and attorneys. And I think we all really think of us as kind of like that, that middle ground. And we are a liaison between interprofessional faculty and departments. Oftentimes, we're the ones who kind of connect people at our institutions because we know what's going on in all the different colleges. And then also a realtor is objective. So they bound, you know, they're bound to act in their client's best interest. And we're also objective. So sometimes, um, you know, someone will come to us and they'll say, well, we just want a few articles to kind of support this recommendation. And we know that that's not the way it works, right? So we provide objective, unbiased evidence um, so that they can actually make a true evidence-based decision. There are five steps in the evidence-based practice process. Step one is to ask the question. The PICO tool is used in order to formulate a searchable clinical question. And we'll talk a little bit about PICO and other formats in just a minute. Step two is finding the best evidence. You must be able to identify the best database or resources for your question topic and develop an effective and comprehensive search strategies um, in those resources. Step three is to evaluate the evidence based on validity and importance. Step four is applying the information or the evidence to the patient. And step five is to evaluate outcomes based on your measurable outcome of interest. So we're going to use this scenario um, to kind of work through the PICO pro process. Nursing administration has noticed high turnover, increased rate of calling in sick, absences, and impacts in quality health indicators, such as medical errors, patient satisfaction scores. Shared governance leadership held focus groups and surveyed nurses, and qualitative analysis showed themes of work-related stress and being emotionally drained by their jobs. Administrators have grouped these themes together as burnout. After asking administrators at other hospitals what they are doing to combat this problem and investigating MUSC resources, leadership has decided to pursue mindfulness initiatives to try to combat and prevent burnout in nurses. Next, we will formulate our clinical question. We typically use a question formulation framework to help us formulate our clinical question. There are many different frameworks available, and which one you use depends on your discipline, type of research, um, and research question. PICO is most commonly used in evidence-based practice, so that's the one that we're going to focus on today. And again, this is just a framework that helps us formulate the clinical question, but it also helps us identify which keywords to use in our literature search. Dr. Scott Richardson developed the PICO acronym, and I had the pleasure of meeting him years ago at the Duke EBM conference. He told us that he was debating between the acronyms PICO and PO. The PO would be patient exposure and outcome. And when he was at the grocery store, he decided on Pico because of his love for Pico de Gallo. So I just love that story. It is so fun. The first element of Pico is the patient population or problem. This is usually the most important aspect of your research question. For example, you could be focusing on a population with a certain disease state or perhaps patients in a certain hospital unit. You may include details such as age, sex, ethnicity, et cetera, but only if these elements in your PICO, um, if they're essential to the question. Based on our scenario, I want you to think about the target population that we are studying. 
The next element of PICO is the intervention. What intervention are we introducing or studying? It could be comparing a new diagnostic test to a gold standard or measuring the effect of one medication or another. Then we have to determine our comparison. In the diagnostic example, our comparison would be the gold standard, but there's not always a comparison. The comparison may be standard medical care, a placebo, or simply no comparison at all. The last element in PICO is the outcome. What outcome are we measuring? This outcome must be something that's measurable so that we can determine the effectiveness of the intervention. For example, if our outcome is burnout, then we must have a standardized way to measure burnout, perhaps with a validated scale. So we're just gonna revisit our clinical scenario real quick. And I want you all to think about what's the P, I, C, and O for this scenario. And then I'm gonna ask you all. Um, it's a little tricky because we do have a population of interest, but we also have a problem as well, which is also an outcome. Um, but just kind of take, a, think, take a, a moment to think about it, and then we will go over each element independently. Okay, so in the chat, if you would all just state, what is the population of interest in our clinical scenario? Okay, so most people are saying nurses, sometimes there's a little, um, you know, nurses experiencing burnout or staff nurses, so there's might be a little extra, but most people are saying nurses. Um, and I would agree with that. Um, I listed hospital nurses, I didn't actually actually specify hospital nurses um, in the clinical scenario, so I don't mean to trick you. Um, but this was a real scenario at our hospital that we did a, um, an evidence brief on. Um, but it might be important. So like, it might be important for you as the researcher working with the team to, to specify where those nurses are. So burnout in outpatient nurses might be handled differently than burnout in hospital nurses. So it's really up to you on like how specific your PICO elements are. And then also sometimes it depends on the literature that's available. So you might develop a really specific PICO question and then you know, find out that there's not enough evidence. And then you might have to go back and just kind of broaden your elements a little bit. Okay, so in the chat again, what is our intervention that we are proposing? <laughs> Some people forgot the scenario, that's okay. We're gonna go back to it. <laughs> but yeah. So most people are assigned mindfulness training initiatives. Exactly. So we have mindfulness. So what about a comparison? Any comments on that before I give it away? Do we have a comparison or, or what would you put here? Yeah, so there could be a comparison group. I didn't specify it. Not doing mindfulness training, no training, status quo. Yeah, exactly. So I didn't really talk about that in my scenario. So it's just, it's basically just the, the status quo, you know, the current state, um, which is no training at all for this population. Oops, I gave it away. Okay, and now our outcome is burnout. Um, that is what we are measuring, and we are hoping that it will be decreased based on our intervention. Now we must identify what type of question that we have, and this will help us phrase our clinical question in a standardized manner. Later on, the question type will help us identify which study designs are best suited for our question. In our last scenario, we decided that we were going to pursue mindfulness initiatives to try to combat and prevent burnout in nurses. So this could be a prevention question, but that scenario also provided evidence that burnout was already occurring in some nurses. So therefore, it could also be a therapy question as well. And it's best practice to phrase our PICO question in a certain way based on the type of question. And basically you just simply have to insert those PICO elements into the appropriate template. 
So if we had a therapy question, it would be stated as in hospital nurses, what is the effect of mindfulness on burnout? And if we had a prevention question, it would be stated as for hospital nurses, does mindfulness reduce the risk of burnout? And for this presentation, I'm going to use our therapy question in hospital nurses, what is the effect of mindfulness on burnout? Now that we have our clinical question, we can move on to the second step of evidence-based practice, which is acquiring the evidence. But I'm going to leave you all in suspense because that is our next webinar, and we're going to talk about searching the literature. Um, so we're going to leave time for a Q&A today. Um, I know Deborah has a little wrap up, so we'll probably leave about 10 or so minutes for a Q&A. Um, but just wanted to remind you all again of the um, dates for the next two evidence-based practice webinars in this series. The next one is searching, and um, that will be next Thursday, same time and place, um, that's Eastern time. And then the following Thursday on March 17th um, will be appraisal and application. We do have a list of references um, that are plenty full, um, but I believe this, this uh, will be shared so that you all will be able to get access to those. And then we are happy to take any questions that you all may have. It's probably easier um, maybe to do them in the chat. I will try my very best to, <laughs> to do this. Um, so if you all have questions, please um, just put them in the chat now and we will attempt to answer them. And I didn't include the Zoom link on here. I think once you um, go to the RML website and register, then um, the, the Zoom links will be sent. And some people said that they went, the confirmation with Zoom links went to their junk mail folder, but that might be where you can check. Um, someone would like to see the five steps of evidence-based practice again. So I can go back. I'm just going to kind of go through here. And there are variations of these steps. So this isn't the only, the only model and the exact steps. This is the one that we use our, at our institution that's pretty commonly used. And then someone else asked to see the clinical question again. So I'll keep it here for like 10 more seconds and then I'll put it back. Um, I'll put it back on the clinical study. Emily, I also put it in the chat so it's easier to grab and like put into a um, notepad or a note file that way. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And some people just had like logistical questions about the um, NNLM website. So Deborah had replied to that and she's going to um, work on the, that website. Okay, so when someone reaches out to the library for literature review, what specific questions do you ask of the person? Do you give them, do you ask them to give responses to the PICO? Um, so if someone at like, it's just basically if I just get a, a question that's like, hey, will you do a lit review on this? I just do a typical, um, like if it comes to me directly, I just do a typical reference interview, like who are you? What is this for? Is this for an assignment? Is this for a publication? You know? all of that so I can gauge um, how, how much help I should give them or you know how, in, how involved or if it's like a project that I'll be involved in. Um, Amanda, do you wanna talk a little bit about the Value Institute and how requests come into that? Absolutely. So we have a, um, a Value Institute request form that's accessible to uh, managers um, throughout all of our divisions. And um, it actually was formulated very closely off of um, the, the, the reference interview that, that Emily uses with, um, with uh, individual patrons. That way we can kind of make it a little easier to triage before we pass anything off to her for 
um, for the literature search. So um, we try and collect as much as, as we can about those PICO elements. Um, and sometimes uh, really what, the, what we noticed over time is that they had, would have a big question and we would then use um, either both the form and an informal kind of uh, reference interview to help uh, solidify those PICO elements, or uh, sometimes they would come to us thinking they wanted one thing, and as we ask some clarifying questions, but they, their need was actually different. So um, over time, we've really been able to kind of take um, both the PICO elements and um, Emily's experience to develop a, uh, a request form that is uh, a little easier to kind of start that process. And someone asked for an example of that, of that form. Oh, um, an example of the, um, the request form with the PICO format. What I will do is I'm gonna, I will have to send it afterwards because I, I need to um, be able, I could, unfortunately, I'm not sure the link is gonna be available because it, I think it's behind our firewall. Yeah. Um, but I can, I should be able to turn it into a PDF and send it your way um, via Deborah afterward. And then someone asked, can there be no intervention in a PICO setup? Um, so those other question formats would allow for a little bit more flexibility for something like that. So maybe like PO what I, was one of the ones I was mention, mentioning has like an exposure. Um, so if you have a question that doesn't really fit the PICO format, you can look into those other question formulation tools to see if those would fit your, your scenario and your question better. Because there's a little bit more flexibility. PICO is, uh, you know, it works well for like therapy questions mostly, but sometimes you kind of have to like, you know, cram other, <laughs> other scenarios into that. And it doesn't always like work as well. So those other um, formats like Eclipse and Spider, that one slide that I showed have a little bit more flexibility. Yeah. And Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say to piggyback on that. I know um, uh, some of the uh, work I do with dietetic interns, I'll, um, they'll have more actual research questions, which fit better with the PO format versus uh, clinical questions, which fit better with PICO. And then um, someone had mentioned like the T in PICO. So I've seen, you know, like I've seen like two T's, like one for time, like time to follow up or whatever. I've seen it in so many different variations. I um, mean, and, and then also sometimes people add a T for the type of question, um, like the type of, you know, is it therapy prevention or type of study design? So there's definitely like PICO has been adapted over time. And, and those are some of the things that have been tacked on to that. Um, okay, uh, I'll show here. Let me go back to the Pico, other Pico formats. So um, these are just some of the other formats that you might use depending on like your discipline or question or, you know, if you're using more qualitative or whatever. Um, yeah. And someone mentioned that like EBSCO has a PICO widget and yeah, I've seen that in like a lot of databases. Um, the PT one has the PICO format. So it kind of like forces you to think about what are your elements, um, that I think is really helpful because I think a lot of people, maybe the, the point of PICO is that you might have a clinical scenario and really the, you want to just focus on one question at a time. So your scenario might have like three different questions come out of it. And so the PICO um, or whatever question formulation question uh, tool you're using really helps you narrow down on a focused clinical or research question, a focused question so that it's not too overwhelming. Um, I think we... I think we addressed all the questions. 
Um, if there are any more, please feel free to put them in the chat right now and we will address them. Um, We'll give you, you know, a few more seconds to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to kick it back to Deborah for a wrap up. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.